Well, good morning. How are you guys doing? Can you guys believe that it is 2015? Anybody believe in that? I just, I keep thinking that we're actually closer right now today to 2030 than we are to 2000. Can you guys believe that? Like it's closer. And I keep asking if you ever saw Back to the Future 2, where is my hovercraft skateboard? Like you guys remember that? He was going, it won't go over water. You know, you remember that? But we don't get it or hovercraft or my shiny silver clothes. I don't have any of those things. But back in 2014, which was so long ago, November of 2014, we actually introduced a word as a church. And we said, this is going to be our theme And the word that God has for us for 2015, and that word was overflow. And we just kind of went through a series together and said, what would it look like if God were to overflow in our lives? That we would just have more of God in every important area of our lives, that he would begin to just overflow to us. And we had, remember, Cinnamon Toast Crunch? You guys remember that? That it would just be piling out of our laps and that we would have more than we needed so that we could share it with our community, share it with those around us, and that we could have an overflow happening in our lives. In fact, we said, here's what we like. We'd like, in 2015, a building full of people that is just overflowing with people. Now, what we also have planned for is a building with great HVAC. Can you guys, can I get an amen? So when we ask for a little extra money for the building, just know it's going towards a better HVAC than this one, okay? So that's, that's what that's happening. You won't have to fan in the new building is our, one of our prayers. But one of the reasons that we'll be having to fan a little bit is this is going to be packed, and we're just praying for that. In fact, uh, what, what we've been praying for is 1,500 people in 2015. Anybody on board with praying for that? with me in 2015. It's a more than I could ask or imagine prayer, but, but that's what we're praying for. And that's why we're building a building. I mean, we're not building a building so we can have a building. We're building a building because we are out of room here. We can't grow anymore here. And so uh, we're asking God for that. We're asking God to overflow with a, a vibrant community, though, not, not just attending that building, not just sitting in that building, but a vibrant community that's serving the least of these. In fact, what we want is for that if Freedom Church were to ever go away in any way, that, that our community, Berkeley County, would go, hey, you know what? We miss them. We miss them because this county is better because Freedom Church was here. And so we're asking this for a vibrant community that serves the least of these, that our Dream Center initiative, our adopt a blocks would just continue to make the impact that they're making. That's what we're praying for. We're praying for just full hearts of, of just authentic relationships. If you guys have delved into the arena of real relationships as a part of Freedom Church. You know that being in a small group, living in community, having relationships in your life that you can count on, talk to, pray for, somebody that can tell you, hey, you don't look good in biker shorts, right? And so you just need that in your life. You're fuller because of it. And so we're praying for that full hearts, full souls from from worship, that just we leave here going, you know what, I don't know why, but I'm just full of worship. I had someone come up to me um, at the Christmas Eve service. They said, every time I come here, no matter what the songs are, no matter what you say, I just sit in my chair and I just cry. They're like, I just cry because God moves so much in my life. And I thought that's, that's just an emotional response to a God that's moving in their lives. And it's an unexplainable move of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're praying for is that during our worship time that we would just to feel the power and the presence of God and an overflow of that. And speaking of that, how about just giving it up for our worship team and our band and just the way they lead us. Uh, you know, everyone who serves at this church is, is just serves with sacrifice, but I don't know there's anyone who can at least beat what they do as far as the amount of hours, time, energy that they pour into and then out of um, every single weekend. They do it just to serve God and to be a part of what Freedom Church is about, and so we, we love that. And, and then we prayed for just full bank accounts, that businesses would be blessed, that, that you're, you'd get that promotion that you've been praying for, asking for, that 
the new job that you need and that the, the, the windfall would come. And not so you can pile in some more into your 401k and not so that you can have better things and more things, but so that you can bless and be generous. And we just want to be a generous church, just overflow, more than we can need and then overflow into our communities and, and just see what's happening. So it's been our prayer. Uh, of the elders of this church. It's been the prayer of the leadership. We've been passing this through for months now, just saying pray for overflow, pray for overflow. It's our word for the years that God would ex- just bless us. And, and he did in 2014 as well. Let me just give you a little bit of an update. Uh, in 2014, we baptized 75 people at Freedom Church. How about that? That was more of a golf clap than it was a we baptized 75 people clap, but it's hot, so I'm going to give you a pass, all right, because I know you can serve in your energy. You don't want to work up more of the sweat than you need to. We grew by 125 people or so in in average attendance in in 2014. Hey, here's some good news. Right now, we're looking at like an early March, middle of the March, move into our new building on Cypress Garden Road. It's going to be good. Uh, We're going to move in, and then we're going to celebrate together on Easter of 2015, have a big grand opening, pack the place out, hopefully have that 1,500 for the first time ever, just on that weekend when we just invite everybody we know and their cousins. And in Berkeley County, we got lots of cousins, so we're going to invite them all. And and then, I mean, the Adoptive Lock and Dream Center stuff that happened this past week, the the amount of people that were fed, the amount of people that were loved on, the amount of children that for just for a little while had some safe, uh, just love and a safe place, the amount of adults who were told, you matter, your dreams matter. Uh, just incredible, incredible what this church is doing. But, but here's what, what I'm believing and what I'm asking you to believe with me is I'm believing that the best is yet to come. Like it really is. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what God wants to do. And so the question then is if you're going to have your best year yet, as an individual, if we're going to have our best year yet as a church, and 2015 is just going to just going to overflow into all of our lives, it's going to be incredible. How do we do that? I mean, how do, you, how do you set up for the best year yet? It's great to say, I'm going to have my best year yet, to be an optimist and, you know, put on Facebook. I'm going to have my best year yet. I'm, I'm leaving this stuff behind. I'm going to have my best year yet. But without a plan, it, you know, it just becomes another year where resolutions fail and you get disheartened and you realize that you're, you're older but nothing has really changed. And so how do you do it? Well, I believe that you have to start right to end right. In other words, you, you begin where you intend to go, right? So you start right and you'll end right. So we want to start our year with just a little two-part series and this is going to talk about how do we get ready for the best year yet. In fact, we're going to start a series on January 18th called The Best Year Yet, but we're not even there yet. we got to get ready for the best year yet. And so we're having an overflow remix. We're just going to remix overflow just a little bit and talk about two tools, two ways that you can have the best year yet. And I believe that the Scripture teaches that we should start every year this way, and we should start with an emphasis this way every year. And so we've tried to do that, and we're going to do it again. Let's look at Matthew chapter 17. Verses 14 through 21, if you have your Bibles, um, I'm going to be in the New King James Version for just a moment. If you have your smart devices, you can go there or you can follow along on the side screen. So Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21, it says, And when they came to the multitude, big crowd, there came to him a certain man out of the crowd. So this one man comes out of the crowd, kneeling down to him, kneeling down to Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he's very ill. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and he said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I endure you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and he departed out of him, the boy, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and they called him over, and they said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, You shall say unto this mountain, remove from here to yonder place. I like the New King James Version every now and then because how often do we say now yonder place? Say that to your neighbor. Say yonder place. You should use that 14 times a day, and it'll be your new word, to yonder place. And it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. 
But this kind, meaning this kind of thing that's in this boy, this problem, this massive undertaking, goes not out but by prayer and fasting. There are seasons in our lives where we need to see an overflow. Um, we're emptied, like of hope. We just don't have any more hope. We're emptied of patience. We're emptied of endurance. We're emptied of kindness. We're emptied of the fruit of the Spirit. We're just emptied. And we need a new, fresh renewal and overflow in our lives. We need to be filled back up again. And so it's a change. It's a change of something that we need in our lives that just has marked you. And you need to, you need to get past something. You need to just kind of move past some pain in your life. You need to move past a habit, a hang-up in your life. You just kind of, kind of move on, but, and you need an overflow in order to do that. And, and what we find is, is that if you always do the same thing, um, you'll get the same results. And so in order to get something new and fresh in your life and have something different that you've never had before, you're going to have to do something you've never done before. And so we look at this and we say, all right, so what do we need to do in these seasons in our life? There's these pain in our lives. In other words, these aren't just basic need problems that we have. These aren't just kind of a little down today. These aren't just like there's a little bit of thing I need to pray for. But this is that thing in your life. And maybe it's just one thing for you. But maybe there's several that pile on you that you worry about, that you pray about, that you can't get past, that you're trying so hard to, but you just can't do it. And you just, you need that. And here's what I've found is that the things that cause you the most pain in life are often related to the relationships in your life. So your family your friends. The, 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 in fact, the most pain in your life often will come from the person you sleep closest to. Now, don't point because it's rude. You don't want to do that. But it often happens that way, right? That, that, because their the closest proximity has the best ability to be able to affect our pain. People far away from us who don't matter to us, we, we worry about them, but the pain comes from those relationships close to us, the friendships that haven't worked out. The, the year when we look back and go, man, look at that. Where'd they go? They, they were in my life, oh, I remember we got in that argument, and we had that disagreement, and we didn't, we didn't continue to stay connected like we said we would, or we just kind of faded away, or that the marriage, it just seems to be right on teetering on the, the, the rocks of just being just off the cliff, and you're going, but I just, it's a lot of pain, and how do we get there, and you look at that, and it's those closest relationships to us, and that's what Jesus encounters in this story, it's, it's this father who is seeing his son a close relationship, whom he loves, and he's seeing him in so much pain and illness. He's tortured, and those of us who are going through or have gone through seeing a loved one suffer through illness, you know it's just so painful, especially a child, to watch and know I can't do anything about it. I can't help him. And so this father, he's in so much pain. And he, he, Jesus encounters this father who's got this hurting and this heaviness in his, in his life. His son has, has fallen into fires because he's having these seizures. And so they'll have a fire pit out to cook things on and to keep warm. And he's falling into it. He, he's fallen into the water. They lived in the sea area. He's fallen into water. And he's, he's, it's got to be with him all the time, in other words. It's 24-7 care. He's always got to be watching after him. So this dad is like those who take care of those with special needs. He's, he's, he's worn out. He, he's just, he can't, doesn't have any more hope. He's discouraged. And he doesn't know what to do, and it's just closest to him, this pain is coming into his life. His son, it tells us in other parts of the scripture, is even suicidal. It tells us that he's been cutting himself. He's probably, in his own way, been trying to end his life because of these constant uh, seizures, and they don't know what it is. They don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to give him comfort, and he's getting hurt, and his father's having to look after him. He's feeling the pressure and the pain. Oftentimes, we're the one who inadvertently is causing pain to someone else, and that's the hardest part. There's some of you who don't want to struggle with the things you struggle with. You don't want to have the demons in your life that you do. You don't want to have the habits, the addictions, the hang-ups, but you do. And this residual effect is you see the family around you who is, is torn down. They're, they're out of hope, and you're out of hope because of it. That's where this boy was. There was a lot of pain here, and this father is fed up with it. He's done with it. He can't take it anymore. So what does he do? Because this is a big thing, not just a small thing. It's a big thing. It's a, it's a miracle thing. He needs a miracle in his life. 
And I have a feeling that some of you, who you need coming out of 2014. Maybe it was a good year. Maybe it was a bad year. Maybe you're in a good place. Maybe you're in a bad place. But coming out of 2014, coming into a new year, it's a fresh start. There's, a, there's kind of a sense of renewal. And you would say, I just, I need a miracle in my life. There's something going on right now for each and every one of you that, that falls into the scale right now for you of something that's going to take a more than, more than me to do it, more than you to do it. It's going to take God to do it. You need a miracle. And during those times, Jesus shows us in the story what we need to do. And I, I think about right now with Connie and I. And can I tell you what Connie and I have been asking God to do in 2015 through Freedom Church, both individually and then coming together and talking about it and praying about it, is it, just, it's more than we could ask or imagine. It's going to take a miracle for it to happen. And, and now my, my wife, Connie, she is not taken to hyperbole. I am. I am an exaggerator by nature. The fish is always bigger. We always won by more points. I'm just, that's just, that's just how I am. I just, I get excited about stuff, all right? So I'm really excited. Connie's not like that. She's very, you know what she says is what she means, and what she means is what she says. You never have to worry about, you know, is she kind of exaggerating or whatever. In fact, I'll give you an example. I went up looking for some sympathy right before the service. I said, she said, how did it go at the first service? I said, it went great, except it is so hot in here. She said, well, babe, you are dressed for a winter storm, so maybe you could just kind of lighten up on the sweater. Probably not the best day to wear a sweater. I was like, true. I'll take that as an encouragement. I will not wear a sweater next time. But, but it's just truth spoken into it. And so lately, she's, she's been kind of just like getting me amped up because she's going, I feel like God is going to do incredible things in 2015. I feel like it's going to be a renewal, an overflow. It's going to be like starting the church again almost. It's just going to be incredible. It's going to be this kind of this new thing. And so I know when she says that, that God's moving in her heart. He's moving my heart in the same way. But it's a more than we could ask for or imagine type of thing. It's just kind of, a, it's kind of a, a miracle thing. We need a miracle. I think all of you have something in your life, not just to do with the church, and I would ask you to be praying for the church and serving the church and, and asking God to do an amazing move of God in this church and be a part of it, but I would also ask what's in your life. That is, it's a miracle that's needed. There's something big that needs to happen. Well, this guy is there. This father's there, and he brings his son to Jesus' disciples because he had heard about them doing some great things. I think about some of you guys. Probably in 2014, you had heard about Freedom Church. Somebody invited you. Somebody told you to come. You were in a place in your life where you were open to that. God drew you to himself, and you said, I'm going to go find out what these people are about. And here's the deal. Eventually, you will find out that all the good stuff that's happening because of Freedom Church, all the impact that's happening in our community, anything good that's going on is not because of Jesus' disciples. It's because of Jesus. And so they go to Jesus to try to meet their needs. There's no small group that will ever meet your needs. There's no community of people that will ever meet your needs. There's no friends, your spouse. No one will ever meet your needs the way that Jesus can meet your needs. It's something we can learn from the story. They go, he goes first to the disciples, says, I've heard y'all been doing some cool things. Can you heal my son? The disciples go, man, we can't do anything. Like, they tried. They, they threw some things out there, but they couldn't get anything to work. And so here's the deal, though, and I love this about this dad. And this is a true father's heart that you see. He doesn't give up. And what I would say to some of you, there's been friendships that have been hard. There's been some things in your small group that have been tough. There's been some relationship carnage, and some of it is people who are part of the church, and things are going on. It's just like, ah, oh, I just I want to break through in this moment. Don't give up. Like, don't keep pressing in. Let God do something big. Let God work through the people that are in your lives. Let God work through them to strengthen their faith and your faith. He doesn't give up. He then brings his son to Jesus, which is where he needed to be in the first place. But sometimes you got to go through the disciples to get to Jesus. And so he finds Jesus. And Jesus starts off with what seems to be a harsh statement about this being a faithless and perverse generation. And he asks this question. Can't you just imagine me and the disciples? You just tried to heal this boy and you struck out. And now he goes over and Jesus is like, how long do I have to put up with these guys? Like, I mean, how long will it take for them to get it? Like, they don't get it, Jesus says. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And I think what Jesus was trying to say is that he was kind of teaching something at this moment. He's saying to them, you need to get it. Because I've been teaching a bunch of stuff, and you need to get it. And he calls them, he says, you're faithless and you're perverse. Well, what does that mean? Faithless is that they're too disconnected from God. Faithless would say, look, you are too far. He's like, if you had been connected to God, you would have been able to carry this out. You would have been able to work in through me. I would have been able to work through you, rather, and you'd have been able to carry this out. But you're too disconnected to God. You are, you are faithless. You don't have the faith. 
to be able to see this. And see, for, for God to be able to give you the best you're yet, and, and for you to be able to have what you think, you're, you're going to have to have faith. You're just going to have to press forward sometimes when it doesn't seem like you know which way to go. You're going to have to step out when, when, when you don't have faith. He says you're faithless. You're too disconnected from God. And he says you're perverse. It's worldly. You're, you're too connected to the world. He says, so you're, you're too disconnected from God, but also you're very connected to the world and your world. You're perverse. There's sin patterns that are starting to come back into your life. There's attitudes that are starting to come back up, and they're affecting the way you believe. They're affecting your faith. And so when we get too connected to the world, we often are also too disconnected from God. And then Jesus prays for the boy, and he's healed. And then his disciples come over, and they say, Jesus, what is up? We tried to heal him, and we wanted to heal him. We were really trying some stuff. We didn't want to, we didn't want to disappoint you. And, and listen, they're saying to him, listen, we want to learn. We don't want you to have to put up with us, Jesus. We want to know what is it that keeps us from having the faith and, and being connected to God the way that we need to be. And Jesus says to them, and this is what we need to learn, he says, it's your unbelief. Your unbelief. And so he's continuing to teach here. And he says, in other words, the byproduct of being too disconnected from God, so too far away from God, too disconnected from God, and too connected to the world, the byproduct, the result of that is unbelief. And see, what happens is when we get too disconnected from God and we get too connected to the world, we will start to worship what we believe in. And we'll start to believe in what we worship. In other words, that's why I encourage you to, to worship. Sometimes you've got to come in and worship before you even believe. You've got to sing the song lyrics, believe, believing that your heart is going to change because you sing them. Sometimes you've got to raise your hand, believing that you're going to raise a hand to a God that can change your whole life. And you, sometimes you worship because what you worship, you will eventually believe in. If we get too connected to the world, we'll start to believe the lies of the world. We'll start to believe the voices that are kind of inside of our heads playing with us, and it produces un belief. And when we believe in anything other than God, it is fruitless. And so here's what happens is, is we get, we're going we're gonna to do better this year. Man, I'm going finally, to finally cut some weight. I'm a, and we're helping you today, by the way. This is a sauna program to help you on your New Year's resolutions. And, and so, but you're like, I'm going to finally do I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to be better. I'm going to cut the habit. I'm, I'm going to stop doing that thing that I do. I, I'm going to stop breaking that commandment. I'm, I'm going to stop doing it. I'm, I'm going to do it this year. This is the year. And then about February, you, you'll be like, man, what were my resolutions again? I can't even remember what they were. I don't even know what they were because you're trying to do it without belief. So, so we can't, we, we're believing in the fact that we can do it. We can't do it. But there's someone who can. There's belief. And you see, in every situation in all our lives, um, there are areas that God wants to do a miracle in our lives. Every situation. He wants to show himself to be God. Here's the deal. God is the only one who can actually show off, and he wants to show off. He wants to be God in that area of your life that you're thinking of. He wants to do something different in your life. But the reason that we have a hold back on the breakthrough, Jesus says, is unbelief. Jesus says it's unbelief that holds back the miracle. It's unbelief is why you don't have the freedom that God has for you. And belief is connected to the mind. Belief is connected to the way we think. And so then Jesus says later, if you get this unbelief out of you and you change your thinking, and then Jesus' words, not mine, he says here, Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this, what he was doing, and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. You will receive it. I'm not sure that we understand, and we, like, I don't think I get it yet. I don't think we understand the power that we have when we're operating in faith. I don't think we understand what God, you see, God wanted us to be able to do things as a church that people who don't know him would look and go, only God. Like, like only God, that can't be them. Like, that can't be their actions. They can't change their life like that. Like, they don't have it within them to make that happen. Their marriage can't get healed like that. I know who they were. And then they would look at it and go, only God. Only God. And so, then why then? Is this building that we're, that we're talking about all the time so important? Why then do, do we ask you to sacrifice 
to give, to be generous of your time and your talent and your treasure. We ask you to make this church one of the most important things in your life. Like we want you to be just sold out for it. Why do we ask that? Why do we ask you to serve? Because there are people who you love. I don't even know them, but you love them. And you care for them. And they're far from God, and they're in pain, and they're hurting. They're like the sun to you that, that is hurting, and you're the one that can bring them to Jesus if you'll just have belief. And see, they're just a little bit of hope away from a completely different life, a little bit of hope away from changing the world themselves, just a little bit of hope away from being an example to others, just a little bit of hope away from their family changing and thus our community changing and our state and our world. So see, there's hope when we get there. There's hope when we say the belief can change something. And for a lot of us, we, we see this hope in, in things that we can't control. So we watch our news channel, whichever side of the aisle you pick to watch. You know, if you watch Fox News, you watch CNN, whatever, you know, you watch it and you go, man, if that could just change. If they would just listen to him. This commentator guy, if they would just do it my way, then the world would be better. I think we've proven that politics is an okay thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's not going to change the world. It's not going to change the world. And so then we go, well, what, what if I just do all the right things? Or what if I just get everybody convinced to eat the right way? Or if I just get everybody convinced to take the right things and do the right things and walk the right way and do the right, we'll just be better. And it's morality. I just, we just got to be better and in our society be better. And so we think that we can get it that way. It's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that way. And then we say, well, what if, what if you're a pessimist? And you go, it's not going to get better. It's just going to get worse and worse. Just wait. That's why I'm getting, you know, getting ready for the apocalypse because it's just going to get worse. I'm a, I'm a get ready. I'm going to get me an underground in my house. I'm going to build an underground pit. Now, in South Carolina, if you do that, I'm going to tell you what that is. That's called a swimming pool. You'll have water underneath your house. But you're going to have an underground pit, and, and you're ready. And you say, nothing's ever going to get better. It's pessimist. Why? Because we, what we don't realize is, the church is the hope of the world. Jesus said, when I leave, you're going to do more things than I did. Have you ever read that scripture? Have you ever grasped it? Jesus said, hey, guys, when I leave, because of the Holy Spirit being here, and the church is going to rise up, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it, you're going to do things that I didn't even get to do, even better and greater things. Incredible, the power that's here in the church. And nothing's going to come out of all the other things that the world promises will change the world, but the church can change the world. Because Jesus Christ loves the church. All right, so then back to what Jesus said earlier, though. This kind of belief, this kind that can change the world, this kind that can change your 2015 to actually have the best year yet, the, the kind that can change your marriage and your finances and your relationships and your relationship with your kids and all those things that you've caught in your mind as your big thing, that miracle needed thing. This kind of belief only comes, Jesus says, from prayer and fasting getting closer to God and disconnected from the world. See, see, prayer is just that. It's just getting closer to God. So Jesus said, you're too disconnected from God. So what do you need to do? You need to pray. You get more connected to God. There, many of you, you say, I want something different in my life. So you have to do something different to get something different. And for many of you, it's prayer. Some of you don't pray at all. Like you don't pray at all. Some of you pray just a little bit. All of us should pray more. We get more connected to God. And then fasting is disconnected from the world. So we're going to disconnect from the things, something in the world that has a hold on me, something that influences me, something that kind of has a part of my life. I'm going to disconnect from the world, and I'm going to connect to God through prayer. So over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about fasting and prayer to set us up for the best year yet in 2015. In fact, we're going to call for 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're going to give you prayer guides on CCB, so you want to make sure you're getting those emails. We're going to give you tips on how to fast. We're going to give you ways to fast. And we're going to start it tomorrow together. We're going to end it in 21 days. We're going to celebrate together all that God has done when we end that. And we're praying for an overflow of big things in the church and in our lives individually, in our community, in our state, and in our world. We're asking God, do an amazing thing, and the only way you can do that is if I have belief, and the only way I can have that kind of belief is through prayer and fasting, Jesus says. And so we're asking you to have an overflow prayer. What's your overflow prayer? I'm going to help you with gr grasping that. Your overflow prayer is this. Get that one thing. 
That thing that you worry about, that area of your life you want to be stronger, that place that you want to really influence people more, that thing you need a miracle in. You thought about it earlier. You already have it. And then fill in the blank with that thing for you and say, God, I've been dealing with blank for so long that I can't even imagine a miracle happening in this area. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there now. Where the truth is, is you go, I just don't even really, really believe that God can do anything about this situation. And some of you are there, and that's the place you need to be praying the most for. And you say, I don't even believe it anymore. And blank will only change because of prayer and fasting. Now, let me ask you a question. This requires a response just to get you ready because I know you've been conserving your energy. How many of you are ready for that kind of belief in your life? Seven of you. <laughs> you I think you're ready. I think, you're, I think you're ready for that kind of belief in your life. How many of you believe, you want to go, hey, look, I want 2015. I want to look back and go, that prayer was answered. Maybe for several years you've been praying the same prayer. You've been trying to kick the same habit, hang up, or just addiction in your life. You've been praying for that same person. You've been praying for your marriage. You've been praying for your finances. And it feels like you're on kind of like a revolving hamster wheel. It's just the same year, same resolutions. How about if this year, if, what if 2015 was a year that, that God worked in those areas? What if 2000 was the 15 was a year that you said, that was my miracle year. That was the year that it happened, that it finally happened, and you had the belief for it to happen. How are you going to get that belief? Through prayer and through fasting. So, so we're ready for that, a vision of your future that includes an answer to that miracle prayer. Look at what the Bible tells us to do and why we do it for 21 days. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 2, it says, When the vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. So we get the idea of 21 days from Daniel. All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. And so here's what we find. 21 days where we're just going to set aside and say, we need a fast track to a miracle. And fasting is often the fast lane to a miracle in our lives. We see all the great moves of God that, that fasting came before it, that people were mourning, they were fasting, they were praying. They'd set aside time to say, God, this is what I need in my life. I'm going to pray for this. I'm going to plead for this. I'm going to ask for this. And since our launch as a church back in 2011, we, we've had a lot of people join us. Hundreds of people, in fact, have joined us since then with the same vision for this church, that we would see people that are far from God, but they're close to you, find their freedom in Christ. And we've prayed for many people who have come to know Christ. We've seen 170 people baptized in three and a half years. We've seen great things happen, and it's all come from the fact that many of you may not know that this church started with and has started every single year since then with a fast, that we've asked our church to come around and fast. And that first one, we gathered about 80 people or so of us together, and we asked this question. We said, God, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to start a church? Do you want us to, do you want us to, to, to attack Berkeley County that way, or is there another way? But God, you tell us what to do. And God spoke so clearly to so many of us that we went, we know what to do now. We're ready to take this mountain. God has given us great things. And, and so we're ready to do that again. We're, as we head in this 2015, we're ready to ask God to do incredible and amazing things. Now, a, a lot of people think fasting is penance. In fact, some of you, this is your first time back in a while, or maybe your first time to church in a long time, and you're like, great. I picked a week to come to church, and he's going to ask me not to eat Krispy Kreme donuts for 21 days. Or even worse, he's going to ask me to do some kind of Daniel fast where all I can eat is hummus. Like, it's just awful. In fact, I, and I'll tell you, as your pastor, I'm never eating hummus. It ain't going to happen. It looks like something you should put on your feet if you want to make them softer is what it looks like to me. And so I don't eat hummus. I don't know what it's made out of. I don't want to know. Don't tell me because I think it's probably gross. But I'm not eating hummus or any of that. But that's not what it is. It's not penance. It's not kind of punishing your body. It's not like, hey, I need, I need to, if I just punish my body enough, if I won't eat something, if I'll deprive myself, then maybe God will love me if I'll do that. Here's good news. God already loves you. He's not asking you to fast so that you can prove your love for him. That's not what fasting is. Fasting is disconnecting from the world, and it's a discipline that we all need in life. So why should we fast? What does the Bible say about that? The Bible tells us, first of all, that we should fast because the followers of Jesus did it. Here's a verse that's often used about fasting to say why we shouldn't fast. It actually tells us that we should fast. Look at this verse. It says in Matthew 9, 14 through 15, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples, Jesus, do not fast? 
And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Now, a lot of people stop right there and they're like, see, we're not supposed to fast. The people of Jesus don't fast. But then it says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. Jesus will go away, which he did, from them, and then they will fast. So it tells us the disciples of Jesus are to fast. Then they will fast. There is a time to fast. Acts chapter 13, 2 through 3 tells us what the early church looked like. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. They planted two church planters out. They heard from God and said, Saul and Barnabas, you're to go out. You're to plant churches. A movement of God was started right here because they were uh, the worshiping and fasting. It says, then after fasting and praying, the two things, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. Great move of God. Think of all that happened out of the launching of Barnabas and Saul into the world and the, the books of the Bible and the moving of God that happened. It came out of fasting and prayer. And, and here's why this makes so much sense. Just a little bit of teaching on why we need to fast and why it makes so much sense and honestly why we struggle with it so much because all of us struggle with fasting, something that's really important in our lives. And it's because of this. You're a triune God. You're a triune being, rather, just like God. God is triune. He's three parts. You are as well. You've got body, you've got soul, and you've got spirit. Body makes you self-aware, right? The body is, I know I'm self-aware. I know what's going on in my body. I can feel whether I feel right or whether things are going good in my body. I'm self-aware. The, the soul makes you others aware. It's your emotions and your feelings. You know when something's wrong with you and your spouse. You kind of know when someone's hurt your feelings. You know when someone makes you happy. You know when you're on the emotional kind of roller coaster. You know that stuff. Spirit makes you God aware. Your spirit allows you to tap into, what am I hearing from God? What, what does God have to say about this? What is God leading me to do? What does God have to say about this? All three are constantly competing in our lives. Whoever is in charge tells the other what to do. And so often, like, so when our soul is in charge, our feelings, our emotions, and you know we say all the time, feelings are funky, don't listen to your feelings. When our feelings are in charge, it tells our body what to do. And so our emotions can get a hold of us. We make, we make weird decisions. We say strange things, and we do strange things because our emotions are leading us. In fact, in the worst and the most horrible of all cases, our souls, our emotions can, can tell our body to kill itself. We have suicide because of that. It's the soul that says nothing can be better. You, you, I'm going to be in charge. Your emotions are going to lead. And it tells our body and our spirit what to do when it's in charge. Our body can tell us what to do when our body is in charge. It tells us to make very unwise decisions because our body just says, do whatever feels good. Man, whatever will make you feel better, you do it. Whether it's sin, whether it's laziness, whether it's depravity, whatever it is, you just do it because it will make you feel good. If you make decisions on what your body tells you to do or what your soul, your emotions, your feelings tell you to do, you always make bad decisions and you'll get yourself into really, really bad situations. A lot of you have been there. But when you allow your spirit to lead, when you're led by the spirit, the body and the soul are active participants, being helpers to what the spirit is leading us to. Our body can accomplish great things through activity and through doing things for people. And, and our soul, our emotions can help us tap into what people are feeling and thinking and be an emotional being when the spirit is leading. And so what fasting is, is it's depriving our body or our soul in some way to allow the spirit to be able to be the one that is fed the most because whoever is the strongest will end up on leading and whoever is fed the most will lead. And so we feed our spirit in order to allow the body and the soul not to be in charge. In fact, Romans 8, 5 through 9 tells us this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. Your body will never tell you to make the right decisions. Never will. It'll never tell you, yeah, yeah, do the thing that God wants you to do. It's going to tell you to do the thing that makes you feel best at the moment. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you who are not controlled by your sinful nature, you are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And so if you have the Spirit of God, if you're a Christ follower, the Spirit can win. You can overcome that feeling. You can overcome that urge. You can overcome that sin pattern in your life. And there can be a miracle in your life if you feed the spirit and you deprive the body and the soul. 
See who will end up on top, the strongest. And how do we get strong? We get fed. So what we're asking is for 21 days, just feed your spirit more than you feed your body and your soul. And what that looks like is, is, is fasting. And fasting feeds the spirit man and starves the other two. So it's a superpower season of ramping up the power of the spirit man. Fasting is not just about food either. It's not a food thing. But there are lots of things that connect to our flesh. Social media fast, news fast, entertainment fast. I, I told Connie what, what I, I felt like God was calling me to fast. And I told her, I said, hey, this is what God's calling me to fast, but I want to do it. And I want to. Because if I do it, I want to have a pass. Because I think, I, I know that God has told me that, that I need to cut out TV for 21 days. There's no TV. Just, it takes up too much of my time. It influences me too much, and especially college football. And so the fast begins tomorrow. The college football championship is a week from tomorrow. And so I'm going to be fasting during the college football championship. And that's bad for me, right? But it's good for my spirit. My body is saying, ask for a pass. And so I was like, hey, babe, can I, can I get a pass? And, and she was kind of like, I mean, she didn't say this, but her eyes said, I mean, if you're a wimp, yeah, you can, you know, and so the, the, that was funny. It's supposed to be at least. But anyway, so I, I can't get a pass. Like, I can't say I'm going to only watch college football on the championship weekend. I, I'm No TV. It's no TV for me. So if you see me watching TV, you know I'm in sin. If I tweet about watching the national championship, you know I'm in sin. You can call me out on it and tell me I'm, I'm not doing my fast the way I'm supposed to. But it's not just food. See, I know that's what I'm supposed to do. Some of you, maybe you're going to fast a food thing. That's a place where you can get more time for prayer. It'll remind you to pray, and you're going to fast food. You're going to deprive that from your life. Some of you, maybe you're going to fast um, social media or something. Some of you should fast Facebook. Like, you really should. Some of you should fast Facebook for 21 years. Like, you really should do that. You should set up a 21-year fast and get off of Facebook for the rest of your life. Like, that's what you should do. But, but for some, some of you, it's, Facebook is this. You get on, and it kind of robs you of your joy and Robs you of who you think you are, and you see these lives of all these other people, and you're like, my life is terrible, and I didn't take that vacation, and my husband's not that great because he didn't make me that meal that I, they tweeted a picture of or whatever. And, and here, here's some advice. If somebody is tweeting, my wife is wonderful. She's the best thing that ever happened. Can I just tell you, they just got in a fight, and he's trying to make up. That's the first thing. He, he doesn't, that's not just coming from the heart. And the other is, if he's made her a meal, and she's like, look at this meal. It's so awesome. And he was in the doghouse for like four weeks, and he's finally getting out because he made this meal, and their life is not that great. So don't believe all the hype. But that's what it does. It's a comparison, thief of joy. Some of you guys might need to get off of that for, for just a little while. And, and seriously, so what are you going to fast? That's the first thing you need to do. Is, and why are you fasting? I mean, you need to come up with that. Why am I fasting? And come up with that big miracle thing. What are you praying for? What is God going to do in your life? The second thing is, you need to say, what are you fasting? Just decide to, you know, and hopefully you've been thinking about this since we kind of laid it out there. You've probably kind of heard when this is going. If you're brand new today, you can decide to say, what am I going to fast? What am I going to fast for the next 21 days? How long are you fasting? We're suggesting that you fast for 21 days. That you just take this time and set it aside and that you do that. And then also I think during this 21 days, I would suggest just a different lifestyle. That you just kind of have a, a different way that you, you're moving through life for 21 days. Don't overschedule yourself. Don't do a lot of crazy things that you're going to places where they're eating stuff that you're going to want. And if you're fasting food or don't, you know, say I'm fasting uh, TV and then go to a party that's showing the national championship game. That wouldn't be smart. Like, you don't want to do that and stay in the other room and just listen. And you say, I couldn't listen to TV, you know, kind of deal. So, so you don't want to do that. Put yourself in a good, sit hey, that's a good idea. I never thought of that, babe. I might, I could listen to the radio instead of what ESPN radio in the Jeep. If you see me in my Jeep Monday night riding around, you'll know what's going on. All right, so I ain't fast in radio. I never said I was fast in radio. All right, but you don't want to put yourself in the situations where you can't get that because you want God to be able to set up a, a, a success in your life. And, and don't be like, I'm only going to drink water for the next 21 days. Number one, you probably die, and we don't need that. We need you here. But also, bite off something that you can do. So if this is your first time fasting, be like, you know what, I'm going to fast something small this time. But I'm going to ask God to take something small and make something big out of it. Or maybe for you, you're a veteran faster. You, you need to up your game a little bit. You, you've done all that stuff before. You need to go a little bit harder this time and ask God to do something a little bit bigger. But most of all, that we would have the faith. Say, God, do something different in 2015. So, so I'm just, I mean, I'm believing that that miracle is going to be answered for you. I'm believing that our church is going to be used to do incredible, incredible things. And I just want you to know, as we begin this year, and next week we're going to talk about prayer and just hopefully amp up our prayer life a little bit. But I want you to know something from the bottom of our hearts. Connie and I are behind you. We really are. We pray for you. We think about you. We're happy that we are getting to be on this ride. Uh, we couldn't imagine doing anything else. 
Someone told me one time, they said, you need to have more balance in your life. You don't need to think about church so much. I told them, the greatest things that are done in the world all throughout the Bible are through imbalanced people. No one balanced ever accomplishes anything. And we are imbalanced and passionately imbalanced for you. And we have got your back. And we're praying for you. And we're believing with you. And this is our life. We've poured everything we have, heart and soul, mind, body, everything into this. And we're believing that the best is yet to come. We're going to have a response time now. And I want to ask you to do a couple different things. Number one, there's some of you that are gonna have decided, you're like, we're going to do this. We're going to do this fast. We're going to do this as a family. During, during our time of response, I'm going to ask you all to do something. So this is for everybody who's going to be part of it. It's just as a family unit to come and light a candle. And to say, this is a symbol of what we're going to do as a family. We're praying for a miracle. And this is just going to be a symbolic way of us remembering this time. God, light a path. We're putting this up to you, God. You do this. There, there are some of you who would say, you know what, there's just something in the way. I've got something that's in the way, and I, I need it out of the way. I, here's what I would say. It's almost like this. You have drugged something from 2014, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. You just drug it. You keep dragging it through, and you've drugged it into 2015. And it's still early enough in the year that we can return gifts, right? You know, you're still returning some gifts. It's still early enough in the year you can return that back to 2014. And say, you know what, I'm going to leave it back there. I'm leaving that fight back there. I'm leaving that argument. I'm leaving that disagreement. I'm leaving that unforgiveness. I'm leaving that pain. I'm leaving it back there. And here's how you do that. Because Jesus crawled up on a cross, and he died for that thing. And so why don't you just go to the cross and go, I'm leaving this in 2014. I'm going to pin something to the cross, and, and it's there. Maybe you write one word or a statement. Just put it up there and leave it. You don't have to drag it along with you anymore. And then for others of us, we're going to go, you know what? I think God's wanting to do some incredible things in my life. And I just want to set up the year right, remembering how he's going to do it. It's through the body that was broken, the blood that was spilled of Jesus. And so we'll come, every one of us, and take communion together, remembering the sacrifice. And we'll sing some of you need to worship so that you'll come to belief. Some of you have got a belief that you never expressed in worship. You need to do it. You need to sing. You need to worship. Raise your hands and let God speak to you through your emotions. and Let the Spirit control your emotions. And then we'll give of our tithes and our offerings as an act of worship because generosity is one of the greatest acts of worship that we can give to a God who gave so much. And we'll do all that as we respond asking this question. God, what have you said to me? And now what am I going to do about it in 2015? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the fact that you are a God who can work mightily in our lives. That there is no pain, no sin, no unforgiveness, no distrust, no worry, no anxiety, no sickness. That you're not bigger than. And so God, we start this year out by admitting we're disconnected from you, God. And we're connected too much to this world. And so, God, we just ask that you would help us to draw closer to you. Push aside the things that control us. Make room for you in our lives, God. So that a miraculous and Holy Spirit-driven change can happen in us. God, help us to respond and not to sit in our chairs letting this moment pass. Pray for the men here that they would lead their families in a response time. Pray together. Ask you to do an incredible thing in their lives. And that we would do this in Jesus' name. Amen.